Greetings, true believers, and welcome back into the Talk Sports Network and Silverman on Soccer. I am the non-soccer playing guy of this part, if you will, Ed Berliner. Thanks for joining us. Let's welcome in once again our veteran soccer play-by-play analyst, whom we never really know until we get him on camera exactly what T-shirt he's going to have on today. Remember, last week it was the uniform of the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, the infamous Bumblebee. This week, I can tell you, it is not nearly as exciting as Bruce Silverman joins us. What do you got there, man? What is uh, the not whole nearly as exciting as when Bruce Silverman joins us? Okay, I, I, I see how this is going to work, but you know well, what? I no, but what I'm believer. saying is, you were exciting at that moment when you had the Bumblebee jersey on, and when I'm looking here, I'm seeing that the shirt you're wearing is not nearly as exciting as the one you wore last week. That's all. Well, you know what? I I, I take offense to that for a few reasons. Number one. (laughs) Okay. I'm offending everybody today. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm good with that. You know, number one, Ted Lasso. Number two, don't forget, welcome true believers. Okay. Good. So, But that's okay. Believe. and, and, And number three, and number three, my kid got me this for Hanukkah. Oh, I see, but, you know, you should have put that first. You, you, your, your kid got it for you, and then it's Ted Lasso, and then it's Believe. So you're okay. Don't worry about it. It's all right. How you doing? All right? Everything good? I am well. I am well, Mr. Berliner, and how are all you? All right. Let's go ahead and rock into this because we uh, we got a couple of important things to cover here this week and something that is getting a tremendous amount of attention <clears throat> that we talked about and which is now growing even further. The battle between FIFA and the rest of the world over the World Cup and whether it will be every two years or every four years. We set the stage now with this report from Sky Sport News. UEFA this morning uh, released a statement saying that they had commissioned a survey uh, by an independent consultancy. And guess what? This survey pretty much backed up what UEFA feel about FIFA's proposals. So the survey says that uh, the proposals are alarming, uh, they would have a deeply negative impact on European football, and they could end up costing European national football associations up to £600 million every year. So that is UEFA's survey, UEFA's take. A couple of hours later, we had something out of FIFA. Guess what? FIFA have commissioned a survey and their survey backs up what they're proposing because they say we've spoken to 30,000 football fans around the world and 63% of them would like to see more frequent World Cups. But if you look at Europe, European football fans are still opposed. Only 48% of fans in Europe are in favour of a World Cup every two years And significantly, in England, Germany and France, there is strong opposition. In England, for instance, 53% uh, of supporters surveyed are opposed to a World Cup every two years. Only 15% in favour. So there we have it. The lines are drawn and the war has thus begun as we initially said it was going to anyway. We have FIFA on one side. We have the Union of European Football Associations, UEFA, on the other, and now the battle really begins. Bruce, as I said, we knew this was going to happen. Now we have competing surveys, competing studies. It is FIFA against the world, my friend, and I can already see that this is going to come down to FIFA dropping the hammer and saying our way or the highway. You know, it's going to be really interesting. I I think a few things came out of that clip. Number one, um, half of our viewers are pulling out their calculators and trying to do the conversion on 600,000 pounds. Uh, So so there's that. Um, The fact that you could find a survey that will say anything you want to say, well, that's determined too. Um, You know, not to get into politics right now, but, you know, 68% of folks in uh, West Virginia are in favor of the Build Back Better plan, and they're dealing with Joe Manchin. So... Like I said, you could find a survey for anything at this very moment. I I think this is a horrible idea. I think this is really going to create a showdown between FIFA and the rest of the world, as you suggested. Uh, But I also think at the end of the day, one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to find out truly how strong FIFA is. And if you've got UEFA and MLS and other um, domestic leagues around 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 the globe, that are questioning whether this is a good idea or not, maybe we're going to see the... We're, we're, I, I think what's going to happen is you're either going to see the end of FIFA or you're going to see FIFA, if it's possible, get even stronger. 
Well, okay, let's, 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 let's stop between. there. I mean, FIFA is never going away. They are so deep in the pockets of governments around the world. There is so much graft. Uh, there is so much hidden money. Hold on, FIFA, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Time out. Sorry, I felt like I was going to sneeze. And there isn't a cough button. <laughs> Wait a minute. So we're in the middle of a show here, and I was waiting for dramatic effect and something really funny here, and you go for a sneeze? Dude, just do it Actually, on screen. Actually, it turned out to be incredibly funny. It's live television. Okay. <laughs> go for it and sneeze. I don't care. Look, have, I've had a lot worse sneezed? happen on camera over, over the years when I've been interviewed. I was going to ask, Trust me. have you ever sneezed on camera? Yes. I have sneezed on camera, I have coughed on camera, and I have had somebody flash their boobies on camera before on live television. So... Outside of that, brother, everything is easy, okay? So let us then draw things back, if you will, to exactly where the host was going before he was so interrupted by the sneeze, if you will. FIFA's but not I going anywhere, sneeze. Bruce. You're insane. FIFA's not going anywhere. This is going to be, this is not only UEFA, but it's, it is the first hammer that's dropped. UEFA can scream all they want. You're going to cost us millions of pounds. FIFA's going to sit back and say, tough. Our way, highway, no World Cup. Come on, brother. Be real. Like, like I said, I, you know, I, I think it is going to create a showdown where we're. It already see is a some, showdown. Some challenges. It already is. We're right there. There's the, there's the beginning of the, there's the first shot fired. Well, I, and and you're right, and it's going to be interesting. Maybe every week we'll just kind of touch on this subject on what the <laughs> latest update is. But if you have UEFA who's against it, and you have MLS who's against it. You know, tell me where the other domestic leagues are. Tell me where EPL is. Tell me where Bundesliga is. Tell me where La Liga is. Tell me where, where you know, these other, you know, unions are. And if everybody is against it and FIFA is for it, it's going to create a showdown. Here in my left hand is the World Cup. Here in my right hand is everybody else. I'm FIFA. This is the World Cup. You want to play in the World Cup? We're going to schedule it every two years because we have the money and the power and the stadiums and the countries behind us. You don't want to play in the World Cup? Here. But but let but me turn my the, hand over and you guys the, can just go fish. Come on. But are the countries in favor? It doesn't seem to be now. Oh, wait. Again, we have FIFA saying that they've got people and organizations that have said yes. You have UEFA saying absolutely not. So my point is, when push comes to shove on this, and you can already feel that FIFA is shoving, but when you get to that precipice, they still have the single biggest tournament sporting event in the world under their contract. You don't want to play? They do. Fine. You will. And the countries, because here's the next thing that, that we need to bring into this. Let's just say for whatever reason, that a country and association says, you know, we're not going to the, we're not going to play FIFA's game. Can you imagine the uproar from the fans in that country? You mean we're not going to get a chance to contest for the World Cup, Bruce? You will have sports riots in the country. The fans won't stand. Isn't against. this going to be fun? Isn't this going to be in fun? In some to ways, watch this whole thing in out? some ways, yes. But in some yeah. ways, it's going to be disastrous for somebody. I think this is going to be disastrous for some smaller countries if it goes forward. I think smaller countries are going to have a very difficult time um, coming up with this type of cash every two years versus four. I think it's going to be interesting to find host cities and host countries um, every two years, you know, because it, it's not easy. You don't, it's not like you got 17 countries that are all lining up to host the World Cup. And when they go to have their votes, they're whittling down from 17. You, you've got maybe two organizations, maybe one in some cases that are bidding on a specific year. Now you're now you're doubling up the number of tournaments, which means that you need to double up the number of host countries and and the the venues and everything else. Easy. Um, I Easy. think I think that this is this is dangerous for FIFA. Um, you, you know, if you look at um, and I'm sure you've seen this too because you know you're a creature of the internet as I am. And every once in a while, you see the pictures Badly. of of um, 
you know, abandoned venues of the Olympics. Sure. Because they can't use them. And, and I think that we may very well see something like that um, with this situation. Okay. I don't think this is as cut and dry as, as you may think. It may come down the pipe, but there are a lot of issues involved. On the other side of that, when it comes down to facilities and places to play, the graft-ridden, underhanded nations of the world, Russia, China, certain African countries, certain Middle Eastern countries, they will line up easily and say, take our money, because they have plenty of it and they want the prestige. Do you really think that the Russians would sit back and say, well, America's out of it? We'll take the World Cup. It becomes Russian money pride from the oligarchs who will do whatever it takes to throw that money at them. So while I agree with you, we're talking about twice the number of venues in a four-year period, I don't think there's going to be a problem finding that kind of money because, again, there's so much back-channel money. There's billions of dollars hidden around the world in FIFA hidden bank accounts that you're going to find it somewhere, and somebody will find more money to throw at them, Bruce. I, I See, I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. Okay, so so let's just do it this way. We'll, we'll, we'll sum up this segment in, in this way. Well, no, there, there's, there's another factor, but you go ahead. I want to I want oh, you go ahead. Oh, okay, well, then, then I'll just say this. If anybody wants to put on the World Cup, contact me. I have Mr. <laughs> Underhill's American Express cut number. Let me drop this in here then. And again, I'll play devil's advocate on the other side. If FIFA is not looking to crush certain organizations, let's speculate for a moment. What's the end game? Nobody gets involved at this level of money and power without an end game. And certainly FIFA knows that there's the possibility that they may fail. So what would be the end game? You and I both know that if UEFA, MLS, U.S. soccer, if they all back off and say, we're not going to be part of your game, FIFA's not going to just turn tail and run and say, gee, we're sorry, guys. We, did, we, we didn't really mean it. It was just a, a thought bubble that we threw out there. What would be their end game in all of this? Every three years? Were they looking to split the difference, maybe? Maybe. Speculating on that. Um, look, it, it, it's a money grab. It is. Yes. Maybe this is just to draw. Maybe it's just to draw more attention in discussion about the World Cup when we're not playing World Cup. I, you know, there's a million things that go along with this. You know, you and I have been involved in sports and, and been on the inside of professional sports for a long, long time. We know the dollar amounts and the dollar amounts that, that we used to see a few years ago, as opposed to the dollar amounts we're seeing today, is just absolutely insane. I the other day, I uh, suffered through the Jets and the, and the Dolphins at, at the Hard Rock, and you walk <laughs> through after you park, and, and you have to maneuver through everything that's going on because they're building the, the, the racetrack. And you start to realize the days of, of someone owning a team and that being their business is over. You know, you look at just gotcha. what's going on uh, the other day, site of the former Joe, Joe Robbie Stadium. Stephen Ross has a football stadium. He plays soccer in it. He has bowl games. He has the Dolphins. He has the, the, the Hurricanes. Outside of the stadium on the same property, he just relocated and built his training facility for the Dolphins. The tennis tournament, the, the Miami Open, they're building a, a, a racetrack for an annual event there. What is going on with sports is so much bigger uh, today. There are so many millions and billions of dollars in sports. And so what we have right now is you're going to have a lot of warring factions in terms of who is going to make okay. the most money in all of this. And I think FIFA, you're right, FIFA has an end game. But what exactly is going to happen? Are they going to get their games every two years? Is it going to stay in four? Are they going to compromise at three? I don't know. I don't understand exactly what they're doing right now because they're very publicly taking the temperature of the soccer world. Or are they going to back up and demand more fealty from all of these organizations toward FIFA when it comes down to the World Cup itself? Or is it possible? And see, this is, if you want to really go out on the, on the limb here, do the organizations of the world get together and form another World Cup, a competing World well, Cup? Well, and that's that's what I was was really trying to get at 
is there are a lot of people who would love to see, very similar to the NCAA in this respect, that would like to see FIFA be replaced. You know, you, you've talked about Brandon. the grifting. You, 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 you know, we could talk about the other issues that FIFA has in terms of how, how corrupt the organization is and the issues that are, are associated. Is, and I said this earlier, is this a power play by FIFA to gain a lot of control? It may very well play out that this ends up being the end of FIFA because you may end up getting organizations like MLF, like uh, UEFA, Bundesliga, EPL, La Liga, you name it, that they come around and say, you know what, let's take control of the game ourselves. We don't like what this overall overreaching umbrella of our of our sport is doing we want to mold the sport more in our own uh image and do some of these organizations make a power play to replace fifa see the that problem with that is well while it's laudable and some people will say gee let's get rid of fifa but then you've got to create another organization and then you have to have somebody run it and you've got to have some sort of organization put up so you're going to have all of these various factions that are all going to get together and say, I want to run it. No, I want to run it. No, it needs to be run this way. No, it needs to be run the European way. No, the South American way. No, the North American way. No, the European way. No, no, no the, the Asian way. That and would shouldn't be a disaster. FIFA be that doing would, that? That would crush everything. You wouldn't have any tournament at that point. Well, in, in, but that's what FIFA should be doing as an organization, and it doesn't. The same as the NCAA should be doing that, um, and that's a story for another day. So let us then move on to the fans themselves, because I have something that I need to bring to the fore here, and it's another one of those issues that people don't really talk about. Well, it gets a lot of coverage, but there's an angle on this that doesn't get talked about. There are fans from certain countries that go to games that use certain language at the games. Right. That FIFA, national organizations, teams are sick and tired of at this point. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you a quick taste of what's happening, specifically with the team from Mexico. On the surface, we're kind of low ranked, but uh, we're always loyal fans. Fans are pumped for Wednesday's Gold Cup soccer matchup in Dallas between Guatemala. We're an underdog, and sometimes underdogs get the best bite. And Mexico. It's going to be like a friendly game, but at the same time, we want a game. We want to win this game, you know. But this sign outside the Cotton Bowl discouraging non-discriminatory language at the game. People won't stop screaming that word. Is a friendly reminder that Mexico is on thin ice. Fans of the team have been chanting a gay slur in Spanish for nearly two decades during goal kicks. And soccer organizations are fed up. After fans yelled it during a men's pre-Olympic qualifying event in March, FIFA sanctioned the team. No fans for its two first World Cup qualifying games at home later this year. It seems that the Mexican national team and the leadership isn't taking this seriously enough. Rafael McDonald is part Mexican and his grandfather played semi-pro soccer in the 30s. He's also the communications and advocacy manager for the Resource Center in Dallas, a nonprofit helping LGBTQ communities. It's enough of a common word because it's a slur that folks know it. It's been shouted at us by people just generally. CONCACAF, which oversees the Gold Cup, has strict rules for the chant. The first time it's heard, there's a warning on the Jumbotron. The second, a stoppage in play. The third, the game could end, but it's never gotten that far. McDonald said it should if organizations want the chant gone. You take away a platform that big, that's that global, with that many eyeballs on it, you better believe that FIFA doesn't want that out there. So there's my question in all this. A crackdown on the fans. Slurs are being used. What really can organizations do? Stop games entirely? I don't see that happening. There's one side of this argument. The other side of this is it's not going to stop. There are people who believe that at soccer matches, this is free for all time and you can basically do whatever you want. So how do you stop people from saying things that they've been saying for generations? And it doesn't make a difference how much you punish them, Bruce, especially at soccer matches. It happens almost all the time. And it's a shame. It's a shame. It I, I've been around this game for a long time. I've sat with owners. I've sat with uh, technical directors, front office staffs, players. Really spent a lot of time with players talking about the the homophobic slurs, the racism, 
Um, I, I know there's a lot of players out there that are working very hard to eliminate this. I, I think at this point, I, I, is it a simple solution? No. But if you were to put me involved in this situation and say, how do we rectify this? We have a zero tolerance policy. You, If a fan is recognized making any comments, making any chance, remove them from the stadium. Don't ever allow them back in. If it continues, remove the fans. If it continues, don't have fans. This is where, when when money gets involved, when if you're if you're not having fans in the building, you don't have revenue. Well, the franchise so goes out of business. Way, it has to at that point. I mean, you can't bust well, fans out of there. Well, but I but I think there's ways of changing the culture. Um, I, I would say in the United States, we, we're a little bit better than other parts of the country in terms of eliminating the homophobic slurs and uh, and the racism and the rest in the game. Um, Mexico has a big problem. Certain countries in Europe have a big problem. I think if if teams go and they say, we've got a zero tolerance policy, if the overwhelming organizations say, we've got a zero tolerance policy, if this happens, we're clearing the stands. If this happens, your team is going to forfeit. There are some things that can be done. Are they going to be popular? No. Are they going to be overwhelmingly uh, adopted? No. But if we put a zero tolerance policy on it and we endorse and we implement and we enforce the zero po- uh, tolerance policy, I think we'll start to make some inroads. Isn't but that if the you thing don't here, though, do anything about it, it's not going to change. Isn't that the, the issue, though, here is enforcement? Because when we get down, no matter what the level of game is, whether it's a an exhibition game, an MLS game, an international game, it counts, whatever, you've got to have the enforcement. And I can really see, is this where we're going at soccer matches, where you're going to have to have an entire stadium, no matter whether it's 20,000 people or 100,000 people, and you're going to have to have the guards and the security at every single section, and you're going to have to have them up and down at the top of every single stair. And if you hear something, or if somebody hears something, excuse me, he just said this. Excuse me, she just said this. Holy spit in the morning, Bruce. I mean, you're going to have anarchy in the stands, and you're going to have people who are saying, you know something, I don't like what she's wearing, and I don't like the fact that she's rooting for the opposing team. So I'm going to say that she threw a homophobic slur out there, and I'm going to get her ejected. It's going to be a nightmare. You can't stop it. Look, this is a very important topic. It is a very important conversation. Yes. And it is one that doesn't have readily available answers. Um, we, we are currently in a society, at least in the United States, can't speak for the rest of the world, but we are in the, we're in a society right now where I'm not exactly sure how much the laws matter how much the rules matter in terms of people that are just thumbing their nose to the rule of law and decency in general. I, I hear you. Um, you know, so so when you have, for instance, today we had a member of Congress say that he would not testify in front of the January 6th commission. He's not the first person that is said he wasn't going to testify. So from that aspect, if we have a government that cannot enforce its own laws, and we have a government that cannot enforce its own subpoenas to be able to uphold the rule of law, how are we going to do it for a sporting event? I think it's a little bit different here because you have the rule of law. Yes and no, it's about enforcement. Well, I I get that, but it's... But it's very different. You have somebody, you have a member of Congress who's refusing to appear at a commission after being subpoenaed or not. And here you have at a stadium, at a sporting event, somebody throwing a a homophobic or racist slur at somebody from the stands. And again, with one, you know it's happened. He has said, I'm not going to testify. With the fan, I'm going to go back to what I said. There's somebody who's going to say, I heard him say it. I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. What are you going to do then? I, I, you're going I to have know, false I, I, accusations I being it. thrown in the stands. There's no way to really hold this. You're going to have 100 people saying, we don't like him because he's wearing a Columbia jersey and we're sitting here in a match for Mexico. Huge difference. We, 
we have a lot of issues. And to borrow um, and paraphrase a line from one of my favorite movies, The American President, um, <laughs> we have serious problems and we need serious people. And I'm not 100% sure that we have the serious people that are really, really concerned with this issue. So what it you're is pointing out here, needs in, in a soccer sense, you're saying that in your opinion, it's the management of the stadium, the ownership of the team, the individuals running the facility, whatever it is, but it's those people from the teams and the leagues who don't have the stomach to get this done? I don't know if every team, if every league, if every organization, if every player wants to, that, that they, not necessarily that they That's want fair. to address this and want to eliminate it, it's that they don't necessarily believe that it is that big of an issue that it needs to be addressed. Now, again, that's different from organization to organization, league to league, country to country. There are some leagues, there are some countries, there are some organizations that take this incredibly seriously. Um, but I don't think it's across the board. I don't think it's in every league. I don't think it's in every team. And just like I've made references to the NCAA in the past, um, in this conversation, I also don't think that there is universal enforcement. And I, I think that is a big part of this, too, is okay. how do we enforce it and how is it uniform? Well, then let's let's go there then, because too often people say that individuals like you and me, when we're pundits and, and commentators and opinionators, that we always hammer away at the issue, but we don't hammer away at the solution. So then let's take just a couple of minutes here before we close out the show and get to okay. what is a, a solution then. How do we then stop people in the stands from shouting these words? How do we punish them? And what do we do about the athletes on the field who don't see anything wrong whatsoever with calling somebody a racist name or calling somebody a homophobic name? What do we do? Where do we start? Okay, so let's, let's start with the fans in the stands for a second. There is a difference between one individual and an entire stadium taking up a chant. You were talking about how do you enforce the one person and the bias, he's wearing a t-shirt, whatever it is, I don't like him, he said something, remove him. There's a difference between the one individual and the entire stadium. Um, and I think what tends to happen at soccer events is an entire stadium takes up a chant. In that particular case, yep. I think, you stop play, you clear the stadium. Well, or do you stop think, play and warn people, say, there has some sort of an announcement that says there has been a chant that has been detected or we have heard this, um, however you want to word it, but basically say, if it stops, we continue play. If it continues, we will stop play and pull the team. Now, you and I both know that if you pull the teams off the field, you're going to have a riot in the stands okay and and if you try so, to clear the stands it's going to be even worse you're going to have bedlam so i don't disagree with that but you got to make some kind of move my question is this and i'll pose this back to you okay at this point with as much publicity as we've had about these issues and the, the, the amount of conversations we've had about these issues are we at the point of zero tolerance are we at the point where the warnings are already there and if it happens, we clear Yes. versus stopping play and just saying, you know, this is going on. If it doesn't stop, we're going to well, clear. I think I think we're at zero tolerance. I, you and I are in agreement here because if it's on the ticket, if it's promoted before the game, if there is signage, if there is electronic signage that warns people, as there is in Dallas for the match let, we let saw. The, let the PA announcer say, you know, with zero tolerance, it happens, we're clearing. You have to say that right at the beginning. You have to say that several yeah. times before the game, and you have to say that right before the game. That's got to be the last thing you say. That, play the anthems, do all the, do all the histrionics, but before you have that kick, that first kick, it has to be that. If this happens, we will stop play. And not only that, I'll take it one step further, Bruce. You have to tell the players. If you are a player and if you use language such as this, we will stop the game. You are ejected immediately. There's no yellow card, nothing. Bull, you're out. And well, that's it's, it. It, it, it should be. An, it, 
In it's got to be an automatic opinion, ejection. What, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take everything to the next level. I agree with you about the players. I'll get to that in a second. You want to take it a step further with, with the teams? Sure. If this happens, we clear the stadium and the home team forfeits. Now that's difficult because I know because I know you're you the on the flip side of that you're going to say well what if it's the visitors and you know they want the three because there's no such thing as a 100 percent home crowd anymore anyway right, right I I know now let's go to the players for a second there was an incident in a domestic league um, not this season but but a season ago um, where there was some epithets um, spoken by players on the field. And my understanding of the story and the video that I saw of it, the um, the referees did not do a good job of handling the situation. And one of the coaches did not do a good job of handling the situation. That is where the leagues, from a player standpoint, from a technical staff standpoint, from anybody who is associated with the game being played there needs to be zero tolerance if a player says okay. something if player says something automatic red um I, i'm improvising with uh, my adapter here <laughs> nice um automatic red and upon um i i believe there should be an investigation but in in, in terms of after an investigation should be an automatic suspension of a season, indefinite. Okay. I'm okay with any of those things. I'm going to go uh, one step further. I, I'll agree with everything you said, but let's take it, let's go even further if we're going to go ahead and create rules here. If it is heard by an official on the field, and if it is verified, that it has to be that. You can't just go by hearsay. He called me this, he said this. The official's got to hear it. The player is ejected. The team that the player is on forfeits the game immediately. That's it. Stop. Because I'm at, good with that that. Point, at that point, you're going to have the franchises worried. Now, granted, the fans are going to go nuts. You can't stop that. But I don't see pulling everybody off and just stopping a game because, again, fandom in this country and around the world is not just fandom anymore. It is fanaticism. And especially in soccer, where holy spit... We have seen some ridiculous riots over something really foolish that's gone on on the pitch or on the stand or in the stands. I fear blood, to be very honest. I I fear you're going to have bloody fights and you're going to have people hit with pipes. They're going to be grabbing chairs and pieces and you're going to have an all out riot and you're going to take people out of there in body bags. And I know people are going to watch this and say, come on, Ed. No, go back and see what's happened at sporting events before. It's, 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 a very, it's a very valid point. Look, when I was with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, I met a player who played with us, um, and I know he's had racial issues on the pitch. Um, and, and part of games that I called and had to have conversations with him afterwards and say, what exactly happened here? What took place? What was the real story? I made mention to a domestic league a couple of years ago. Um, if I remember the story correctly, it was a homophobic slur that was lodged in the middle of a game. And the manager of the team that had the player that was the target of the comment, after the referee did not take advantage or not did not take control of the situation, the manager took his team and walked off the pitch. Ultimately, that decision prevented them from having the number of points that they needed to make the playoffs. And if I remember correctly in that situation, it was either, the game was either a tie at the point where they took off the field or they were winning. So had they continued to play the game, they would have gotten the points needed to make the playoffs. But instead, what happened was they fair, they they forfeited the game. They forfeited the points. The league did not step in. And as a result, the team lost, uh, lost the opportunity to play in the playoffs. I'll give you the next step. If a chant starts in the stadium that is homophobic or racist, the game is stopped. Both teams forfeit. They get both hit with a loss. I mean... 
try that on for size sometime and see what happens. And the first time that happens, and the, the fans and the, the teams are going to go nuts, and the fans will go well, nuts. Well, that, that eliminates the concern that I had. That which, eliminates partisanship. Which I said a moment ago, which is the home team forfeits. Right. Yeah, you know, if we want to eliminate this, we got to take big, big steps. You know, on the field, you got to take the, the ball Dolphins by the balls, game. baby. <laughs> at the um, at the Dolphins game the other day, it, it said, you know, end racism on the field, which is the NFL sponsored slogans that they have now. The NFL does that. It's on the back of helmets. It's everywhere. Well, and and, and so to that end, I would I would hope that we would see the same type of movement. From you know, we're in the United States. We're talking about the United States. Um, I'd like to see MLS adopt that. I'd like to see USL adopt that. Bravo. I'd like to see NISA adopt that. Bravo. I mean, well, I mean, now you got to have somebody who serious. now you got to have somebody who is able to grab that ball by the balls and is able to be cur- courageous enough to do it. That's the next step. Well, I, I, I really think in this particular case, it takes it, it takes the players, it takes the coaches. And it takes ownership um, to take ownership of the issue and seriously address it. Not a band aid. And the fans. Not a, not a, you know, not a band aid. Not yep. a, you know, a discussion point. Let's put down some really hard and fast rules that will really eliminate this from going on. Agreed. And you know, we've we've spent a lot of time, and most of the situations come from fans in the stands. But don't don't lose sight of the fact there is racism, there is homophobia, not just in soccer. It's in baseball, it's in, in society. football, it's in everything. It's in society. But we're talking soccer. We're talking soccer. Let it start with the players. The players can take a zero tolerance stance on their own. They can hear they can hear things on the field. And they can go to the referee and say, we need to stop this. And the players need to call out their teammates when they pull this stuff. The problem that we have is too much protection. The problem is, you know that you've got a teammate that's saying things. Do you really allow that teammate to put your team in jeopardy? Or do you really take control of the situation get the captain to go over to the player and say, this is not going to be tolerated. And if you continue, I'm going to management. You're not going to be here. I don't care if you're the leading scorer of the team. I don't think you, I don't care if you're the best goalkeeper. We are not going to tolerate this on this team. The problem is I've seen too many situations where players say something and they defend their teammate because you're supposed to defend your teammate, right? If a fight if a fight starts in in hockey, you jump in and and you you help defend your your teammate by taking out the guy in the in the other jersey across from you while your guy is still in his fight. That's what we're that's what sports are all about. Protect your teammate. Well, we've gotten to the point where there's some things that you shouldn't protect your teammate for: racism, homophobia, um, any bigotry of any kind should be completely eliminated from sports and it has to happen from within and i'm just talking about what happens on the field of of play wonderfully said i'm going to leave it right there because there you go people you didn't think that bruce and i would ever agree on anything we agree on all that because we do believe uh if you'd like to get a hold of the man and tell him how you believe please do facebook is at bruce silverman twitter is at silverman show and of course we meet back here on a weekly and occasional basis right here on the Talk Sports Network. Mr. Silverman, always a pleasure, my friend. If I don't speak to you beforehand, have a very Merry Christmas. Enjoy it. Relax and, and stop worrying about all those people who are down on the boats playing the music until 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> hey, you know, what, what's really funny about where I live is the, the way I describe it is, and, and you have to be old like us to appreciate this, it's kind of like sitting in your car and spinning the dial on the radio and wherever it lands, that's the music you get because that's the soundtrack that I have. It's <laughs> you zip it this way and it's rap. You zip it this way and it's rock. You know, the other day, the other day I had purple rain at like, like 1230 in the morning. I was What's okay with that. 
By the but, way, Bruce, but Mark you... Anthony, but Mark Anthony at 3 a.m., yeah. I, I draw the line there. You ever call me old again, Bruce, I'll throw you off your balcony, okay? Okay, old man, great to be <laughs> with you today. Merry Christmas, and uh, hopefully everybody has a happy and a healthy one. And, yes, you can play with the hair. We all know it's a wig. Really? Okay. <laughs> nice job. We'll talk about that later. Uh, bye, Bruce. Uh, don't forget, get a hold of Mr. Silverman. Well, really, don't even bother with him. Well, you can't. He's, he's, he's a good guy sometimes. It's just it's what happens when you spend all day drinking. Um, if you want to go ahead and get a hold of me, don't forget, you can Excuse also do it at me? Facebook and Twitter at, at Berliner Speaks and catch the show here. For Bruce Silverman, everybody here, I'm Ed Berliner all on the I Talk Sports to- Network. Oh, cool. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. If we don't talk to you beforehand, Merry Christmas. Rock on, true believers. See ya.